Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here. My name is Diana Barnard, and I'm from Weybridge, Vermont. I um, took a wrong turn heading into the assembly room and had an opportunity to view the rest of your capital and was reminded just of the majesty and awe of the legislative process, which I um, am deeply indebted to and really support the hard work that you guys are doing. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. I am a family medicine physician, and I am also board certified in hospice and palliative care. I have about 25 years of clinical experience, and the last 10 years of my professional life has been dedicated solely to caring for individuals who are living with serious and life-limiting illness. I am an employee of the University of Vermont Medical Center in Burlington. I'm assistant professor of family medicine in the division of palliative medicine. And so in Burlington, as you guys probably know, we not only care for a lot of Vermonters, but a good part of upstate New York. Um, despite that experience, I'm speaking today from my own professional and personal experience. Uh, I want to start with a story of uh, my patient, John Roberts. And, and by the way, I should also say that I have consulted on and I have prescribed for several patients under Vermont's aid and dying law. So John was a 94-year-old World War II veteran when I met him. And he was living with prostate cancer and was under the care of a very good team of doctors, a primary care provider, a urologist, and an oncologist. And he was referred to me because Mr. Roberts really wanted to have a very deep understanding of his illness and his treatment options. Uh, he was aware that treatments offer benefits and burdens, and he was the kind of person who really wanted to be in charge of his care and understand both. And he really wanted to have a solid end-of-life plan. And so the first day I met him, I learned a lot about him. I learned that he was a... <coughs> a veteran, and that was a deeply important part of who he was, and his years of military service had really informed his life. He had also traveled extensively, and I think his exposure to the diversity of the world really had a powerful influence on him. And in retirement, he had worked a lot of hours volunteering and helping others. And so, you know, you may be beginning to see the the essence of his story, which is that he was very self-reliant, he was independent, uh, being so was a core part of who he was. Like most of my patients, he wanted to live as long as possible, but he also had some conditions under which he would consider living not to be acceptable. He knew he had a terminal illness. He was not afraid to die, but he did fear losing himself and what was important to him in the final days and weeks of his life. So during our meeting, we discussed his treatment options. I learned a lot about him. And at his request, we also explored um, Vermont's aid in dying law. And about three months later, I learned that Mr. Roberts had had a period of sudden decline. And uh, in talking to his providers, it was clear that this decline was related to disease progression and that his prognosis was now looking like several weeks. He had enrolled in hospice, and he wanted to meet with me again. He was honestly not happy about it, but quite gracious in accepting help. Help with simple things like going to the grocery store or cooking or dressing or using the bathroom. Um, he, he was so self-reliant. It was hard at the very end of his life for him to imagine losing those things, but he took great comfort in the fact that he was still in his own home, surrounded by the mementos which really spoke to the life that he had fully lived. So John went through the very carefully laid out process in Vermont for our aid in dying process. He chose a date. He had his good friend Hal at his side, and he ingested the medication and died very peacefully in his home on his terms. And when I spoke to Hal the next day, he told me that Mr. Roberts looked really serene in those moments between when he took the medication and before he became unconscious, and that he voiced gratitude um, for having been able to live a full life and to die on his own terms. I'm, I'm really proud to be a part of a medical community in Vermont where we honor a diversity of opinions, where we believe in patient-centered care, we believe in choice at the end of life, and where we recognize that medicine is different than it was a couple of generations ago, and people die differently, and we need new tools to address the suffering that sometimes comes with it. 
The Vermont Medical Society in November of 2017 reversed its opposition to our law and shifted toward a solidly neutral stance on the law, which is really a reflection of the diversity of opinions that physicians in Vermont hold. Um, in January of this year, 2018, the Vermont Department of Health issued a report on our law. We have about four years of data now, and it showed that a total of 48 patients had received a prescription. 29 of those patients used the medication, and 17 did not. Most of those patients, 83% of them, had cancer, and 14% had ALS, with a very small percentage having other diagnoses. And this it really mirrors the experience we have from all of the other states where aid in dying is legal, particularly in Oregon, where we have more than 20 years, not only of experience, but really robust data gathering that shows what's true in Vermont, which is that the law works well as intended. It's effective. None of the concerns about abuse have been, have been brought to reality. And uh, very, very importantly, the rights of physicians and patients who do not believe in the concept, who would not want to avail themselves of this law, are fully protected. In addition, I think it's important to emphasize that the process is completely voluntary and it can be stopped anywhere along the way. There are two physicians involved with every patient and they independently must evaluate the patient and determine that they have a terminal illness and a less than six month prognosis and that they are capable of understanding and participating with the law. It is a routine part of the care that I and other physicians give every day to assess patients' capacity to make sure that they understand the medications we're giving them, the tests that we're doing, and the treatments that we're offering. If a patient is not capable, then the process <coughs> stops, and we must find other ways to address their suffering. And for those very few cases where perhaps it's not clear, our law allows for a psychological evaluation to confirm whether or not the patient is capable of going forward. Um, I think I'll stop there because I'd like to give some time for questions. If you do have any, I really want to thank you for your, your hard work, your willingness to consider this law that would allow terminally ill patients an option, a measure of control at such a deeply personal and tender time at the very end of their life. Thank you. Um, I just have one question. If you could make changes in the Vermont law in, in any direction, is there anything you would change that comes to mind? You know, I think our law is working well. I will say that sometimes the, the time frame, the waiting period, um, proves to be a burden for patients because in my experience, people wait very far into their disease before they look to this option. Okay. I think that's different from the common misperception that when people first get their terminal diagnosis, they might do something quickly. But the reality is that patients want to live and they wait. And so having access but not having it burdensome be, is, is really important. Mm -hmm. Thank you.